All right, I'm unmuted. Perfect. Well, sorry, sorry, everybody, for the technical difficulties. Thanks, Jessica and Bryce and team uh, at Cal Poly and Pomona for uh, for getting this all together. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, this this is my talk there and back again, a cyber de defense retrospective, and ultimately. This is, you know, Jessica told me the theme for this conference was 30 years of cyber. And I said, well, I can't really speak to 30 years of cyber because I haven't been in cyber for 30 years, but I have been in cyber for about 15 years. So let's talk about that. And I think that, um, you know, whenever I first got into industry, I didn't necessarily have somebody to tell me, hey, here's here's what the 15 years before uh, really looked like. I, I got some of that from uh, some family members who worked in industry. Uh, but I didn't get this level of of detail in terms of some of the significant events that have kind of driven, you know, executive thinking, um, practitioner thinking, driven the vendor space and what types of tools enterprises are deploying. So these are my reflections on uh, 2010 to current enterprise cyber defense. So quick disclaimer, and just to be clear, everyone can see my screen, right? Can I get a thumb up or, or something like that? Yeah, we can see <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, we'll see it. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks, Mason. All right, so quick disclaimer. All the opinions expressed here are mine. They don't represent my employer. I'm not actually here on behalf directly of my employer, just here as an information security professional. Uh, this is ultimately a point in time snapshot of my opinions and what I've seen throughout my experiences. It is subject to change. I might learn something from you that changes my mind. Uh, any references to company names, brands, logos, it's really just in the historical context of events that I think were significant cybersecurity events. It's not any way a, a criticism of those brands. Lots of companies have breaches. In the past 15 years, most major brands have had some sort of publicly exposed breach, right? And then several prior works are referenced, and I'll do my best to credit those original authors. A little bit about me, Andrew Swartwood. Uh, my Twitter and my blog are here if you'd like to, to check those out. They're a little bit outdated, but might be some things of interest there. Uh, on my blog, I've got three or four forensic CTFs that I pub published years ago um, that I still get some feedback on occasionally. Uh, my career path, I started as an IT generalist. I worked um, you know, basically doing everything related to IT for a very small company and for myself as sort of an independent consultant uh, for, for a couple of years. I then got an opportunity to take a contract to be a firewall administrator at a Fortune 500 company. And that was actually a pay cut, uh, but it was the best move I ever made because that was a firewall administration, entry-level job uh, in the information security department at this very large uh, insurance company. And that was really my foot into in the door. And that's kind of where this story begins in that 2010 time window. Um, at that company, I was able to learn and develop, get a lot of training and a lot of, uh, like the, the keynote speaker said, that outside of work or outside of school, uh, community engagement and self-training uh, that enabled me to be one of the first incident response and security operations center analysts at that company. From there, I continued doing a lot of uh, training and development, and I got the opportunity to get into penetration testing and red teaming at that same company. Fast forward a couple of years, I got the opportunity to change jobs, change companies, uh, and become a manager of incident response analysts. So taking some of that forensics training, some of the real world experience and responding to incidents that I had and apply it to managing teams of analysts. And now within that same company, I'm a director of teams of security engineers, really focused on mitigation engineering, applying cyber threat intel, applying incident response lessons learned to quickly prototyping new mitigations, uh, coming up with, hey, what is the best way to spend finite resources in terms of securing uh, this organization based upon what we know about threats? And you'll find in your career that that's not always the, the core reason why decisions are made in information security, there's a variety of reasons, um, but keeping threat focused is, is quite important. In terms of certifications, I've got a bunch of certifications, uh, mostly technical stuff. I think definitely most proud of my OSCP 
that was a stretch for me at the time. I think I've got uh, somewhat of a, uh, you know, original, you know, OG uh, OSCP from 2014, although I think it, it existed for, for years before that, um, but have been the beneficiary of a lot of SANS training, as you can see, which, you know, is a very good organization in terms of uh, developing technical skills quickly. We're going to talk about towards the end of the presentation, some of the other options that exist now that many of you are probably aware of that I think we're in sort of a golden age of infosec training. I wish we had all the opportunities whenever I was first getting into the industry uh, to learn that you do now for cheap, for cheap. It's the difference of, you know, seven, eight grand to like 10 to $30 a month. It's incredible. On the personal side, I'm a husband, I'm a father. My hobbies uh, include cars. I'm very much obsessed with cars. Uh, don't talk to me about it. I'll bore you. Um, mountain biking, cooking, like playing video games. So in the upper right hand there, you've got a little collage of pictures, hanging out with my cool kids, dad bod X games, uh, jumping a mountain bike, um, Miata with a big wing on it, and a uh, racing a car that looks like a, a bottle of ketchup. So that's about me in a, a nutshell, hanging out with the cool kids and my hobbies. So the main points of my, my talk here. So over the course of my career, I lived through changes in the enterprise attack surface, the attack techniques that are used, the defensive tools that you need to actually defend a network. And there are some fundamentals that have not changed and are actually unlikely to change probably in your career. Um, the, the fundamentals of how to secure securely engineer systems haven't really changed. But a lot of those things are very hard for enterprises to actually implement. So examples would be like network segmentation, least privilege uh, for authorization, secure authentication like MFA and doing so in such a way that it can't be bypassed. Those are all really hard. And you'll see in sort of the vendor space that a lot of the offerings are intended to not bypass some of that difficulty, but just push organizations faster into those areas. Sometimes it's a good compromise, sometimes it's not. But falling back to those fundamentals will probably never really hurt you. Um, they are very constant and things to keep in mind, but they have to be adapted to new technology. So I think a lot of people in industry, uh, maybe about my age, a little older, you know, some people who came in at different times are really just applying those old fundamentals or the fundamentals from whenever they first learned to new attack surface, which in some cases is fundamentally different from what I was dealing with uh, 15 years ago, which we'll talk about. And so, you know, this new technology and staying up to date with it and what the attack surface implications are, absolutely key. And then finally, in terms of what can you actually do about it, I'll present to you a model or just a very high level model in terms of a continuous defense cycle. So finding and filling your visibility gaps, developing high fidelity detections, continuously reducing your attack surface, developing mitigations and countermeasures, rapid prototyping, and then developing analysts. So that's you, that's me, uh, that's you know the the folks who actually do the work. You know, you're probably in the first five years of your career going to benefit quite a bit from like a AI copilot, some sort of LLM tool. Uh, but it is definitely not going to replace you in your your career. If you're worried about that, I'm I'm here to say a message of hope. Very unlikely that information security decisions are going to uh, get replaced by AI. It's extremely hard, and it's mostly a people problem in terms of driving systemic change in uh, in enterprise. All right, so let's get into my retrospective. So this is my personal recollection of the significant developments in cyber over the past 15 years and what that meant for the attack surface, what it meant for attack techniques that were valuable uh, to attackers uh, and how it changed how we have to defend. I hope a few people get the uh, Pete Rock, CL Smooth, uh, Troy song reference. If you haven't, it's a good song, kind of a sweet song ultimately. All right, 2010 to 2014. I classify these as the good years to be an APT or advanced persistent threat, which is ultimately a term that was created by you know, the US government to describe nation state threat actors uh, that were showing some greater uh, you know, sophistication at the time than 
you know, what you'd consider run of the mill ultimately, right? Right out of the gate in 2010, a uh, bombshell from Google in terms of Operation Aurora. So this is a major multi-year attack uh, suffered by Google that ultimately led to the thought process that brought us like zero trust network access and zero trust models, right? That is that is the seed that was planted where Google decided they had to change how they were operating their networks and it planned the seeds for like Beyond Corp and some of the product offerings and thought process that they published. In that same year, we had Stuxnet. So a destructive attack, you know, sort of a cyber war uh, to use a buzzword uh, activity uh, by by the West against a, you know, a country in the Middle East. And that wasn't necessarily directly actionable by, sorry, my dogs are barking. Perfect. Perfect time for them to bark. Uh, but it is interesting that it happened on a USB stick, which is still a relatively common uh, attack vector, despite all of the advances in, in technology. Um, 2011, we see Game Over Zeus. So Game Over Zeus was uh, a reimagining of Zeus, the banking Trojan, which were still very common in this time period. So Game Over Zeus uh, was created by... Uh, Evgeny, who's the guy in the picture, who I'm told by one of my Russian colleagues is actually quite a bad guy and quite a jerk. Um, but I've always just enjoyed him because he has such ridiculous pictures like this one of him holding the cat in matching pajamas. Uh, he definitely enjoyed the wealth that he gained through cybercrime. Probably a bad person. I'm not idolizing him or anything. But he did run a very prolific botnet at the time that anyone who worked in 2011 knew about this and was probably dealing with incidents related to uh, infected hosts. There was a lot of that botnet activity in this time period. 2011 also introduced us to some of the more prolific hacktivist groups. So these were groups of kids and miscreants getting together to attack companies, attack organizations based upon some sort of ideology. Uh, and they did a fair amount of damage in that time. It was something that was on the mind of uh, CISOs. It was something that was on the mind of of people in industry. And, you know, the tactics, techniques, and procedures of these groups were actually being analyzed. 2012, we saw destructive attacks from nation states. So Shamoon and Flame from sort of two opposite sides of the pond, destructive attacks against, uh, so you see a lot of posturing by nation states in, in this time period in terms of how they're going to uh, try to go from just espionage and stealing data to uh, you know doing something greater, some sort of greater objective in terms of how they utilize cyber. 2013, like mark this year in terms of something that's very important in, in the history of cyber, Mandiant released the APT1 report. And in this whole time frame. Every CISO, everyone in information security, uh, the advanced persistent threat was kind of topic number one, right? Like there was a huge amount of hacking going on for intellectual property theft, for you know na national espionage reasons, largely against Western organizations. And it was quite an interesting time uh, for reasons that I'll get to, into in the next slide. Snowden leaks happened in 2013, and while this doesn't sound directly applicable to information security industry, it did change things for multinationals. Because sure, if you had an all U.S. based company in that time period, you know it's almost like I don't want to say who cares, but you know that 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 probably was kind of the sentiment. If you had European or you know APAC region uh, or you know Africa or anywhere other than the U.S. Uh, or Five Eyes nations, you, those people would be very concerned. Yeah. And I think this set the stage for some of the changes in terms of regulatory posture around you know privacy of people data. Uh, another nation state attack that happened in this time was Sony hack. So if you if you weren't around the industry in that time period, there was some drama about a movie that Sony was making. And they got ransomed. They had a destruct destructive attack, and so that's right, right in your uh, neck of the woods there that they were dealing with that that intrusion. And then finally, Adobe and Target, LinkedIn. These were attacks that more or less affected everyone. 
So everyone you knew either had to get a new credit card because they shopped at uh, Target or they had an Adobe account and their password was leaked. Uh, it was really kind of like a socialization change in terms of understanding about cyber. So 2010 to 2014 key, key takeaways. APT attacks really dominated the CISO conversation. Uh, these threats were inherently covert. And so very few of the attacks were actually publicized. Uh, the rules around disclosure of breaches were different or not really as well defined, right? So even for publicly traded companies, it wasn't set in stone that they had to tell anyone if they didn't think it was uh, you know, relevant that they had this nation state espionage attack. Uh, and so if you look for, hey, how many companies were attacked by nation state threat actors in you know, 2010 or 2011, there's not gonna be as much there as you would see today. So that's a big difference. Uh, this gave rise to a lot of private uh, cyber threat intelligence sharing groups for everything from atomic indicators like IP addresses and uh, you know domains and hashes of files, um, and also really gave rise to some of these massive incident response firms that had a ton of work to do because all of these companies were getting hacked by uh, you know nation state threat actors. At this point in time. Ransomware was really hardly even a concern. Um, ransomware was really, and I don't want to trivialize it, but it was mostly like individual machines. So there were classic ransom cases where uh, you know, your machine would lock and it would say, your machine's been taken over by the FBI, send money to Western Union or something like that to unlock it. There are also some automated cases where you know it would attack a local network share, similar to some uh, classic worm behavior. And then uh, towards the end of this time period, there was a big wave of DDoS or distributed dial denial of service uh, extortion. And a lot of that wasn't even real. They would just send emails out to companies and say, hey, if you don't pay us, we're going to denial of service your website into oblivion. And presumably a few people paid. But I think a takeaway in terms of ransomware is that they had not figured out how to make ransomware profitable or su sufficiently profitable to kind of quit your day job. So it just wasn't as big of a factor. What did enterprise attack surface look like in this time period? A lot different from today, actually. Um, you know, 15 years does drive some advancement on premise. And I mean, to be fair, some companies still look like this. Um, so your mileage may vary as you, you move from company to company, uh, but this is what I think was very typical in that time period. On-premise, Microsoft Active Directory with pretty much no production public cloud was what I saw across a lot of companies. So very much an on-premise classic environment, on-premise data centers, classic tiered DMZ model, MPLS WANs connecting all of the, the offices together. On the you know security tooling side, we were not well equipped in this time period. EDR was not common. There were some EDRs, but it just wasn't a table stakes control like it is today. If you go into a SOC tomorrow, you're probably going to be uh, faced with, here's the EDR console, and this is kind of your main interface almost if it's not just all in a uh, in a seam. Uh, so Sysmon was only released in 2014. So if you're not aware of that, that's the uh, Microsoft Windows uh, sysinternals tool that has some EDR-like telemetry from it. How did attacks happen in this time period? Well, malicious emails leading to endpoint compromise was almost exclusively the way that targeted attacks work. Um, you know, Macros and Office documents really came in and out of style. They will probably come in and out of style many times in your career. They have in mind. Uh, businesses still use macros. Macros run code in the context of a document, in the context of you know Word or Excel or PowerPoint. Attackers are kind of off it right now in, in current state, but they'll come back to it. In this time period, another thing that was really different in terms of initial attack vectors is there were exploit kits like Black Hole or Neutrino, and these were a major distributor of opportunistic malware. So uh, plugins like Flash, Java, ActiveX, these were mostly to blame in terms of the exploitability of browsers. But a lot of malware strains at that time period were just getting dropped on people's machines via drive-by download. So 
uh, malicious ads, that sort of thing, were a huge deal because the exploit kits were very effective. In terms of post-exploitation, PowerShell post-exploitation really exploded in this uh, time period. And it was backed up by frameworks like Nishang, PowerSploit, that pretty much made it easy for anyone to do PowerShell post-exploitation. And so it made it more accessible. A lot of people had developed this tradecraft over time who really understood PowerShell and understood Windows internals, but they made it more accessible. And then Active Directory privilege escalation was by far the most common route to achieve your objectives in a uh, enterprise environment. So a little bit about 2010 through 2014. Fast forward to 2015. Uh, this is a time period that was really dominated by two themes. So nation state threat activity that affected enterprise security programs. We had the politically motivated you know, DNC hack in 2016. And around the same time period, we had the shadow brokers, which was probably the same group, um, but they released exploit uh, material, exploit you know, proof of concepts and tools from another intelligence agency uh, that ultimately led to these huge attacks between WannaCry and not Pet Petya. So WannaCry, uh, one of the larger worm attacks that we've ever seen, which was enabled by uh, one of these Western, uh, you know, defense capabilities that was called Eternal Blue. It was a remote code execution vulnerability in the Microsoft uh, SMB protocol. And so basically within a few months of this being released, they repackaged it into a ransom tool and any system with SMB exposed to the internet was going to get hacked by this. Any system that was connected to those systems was going to get hacked by this. In total, this ransomed, I think, a quarter of a million computers. So the scale of this was absolutely huge. Uh, it shows how important it can be to patch. It shows how important network segmentation is. Uh, you know, if you're not exposing SMB to the internet, if you're not exposing SMB to every system internally, you know, you would have had a lot more resilience to this type of attack. Not Petya was very similar in that it was using Eternal Blue for spreading malware, spreading a destructive attack. But this was more of a cyber war activity. Uh, that was focused on disrupting Ukrainian companies and uh, Ukrainian affiliates, you know, companies that do business with with Ukraine. It was a it was part of a, a greater offensive against the country and it had collateral damage. Another thing from 2017 is uh, crypto jacking, which is ultimately compromising some sort of system to run, uh, you know, a crypto miner on it, which kind of just came into prevalence, uh, you know, in this in this time period in terms of a large scale. Uh, and this was something that was seen, especially in public cloud infrastructure where, you know, test environments and things were being stood up. Then the next major theme, other than the nation state activity uh, from this time period, is in the late half of this, the emergency emergence of the ransomware behaviors that we know and don't love today uh, came out. And so, you know, th these ransomware behaviors I'm going to describe have really dominated the news cycles around cyber, vendor product offerings, the workload of every IR firm. Uh, the two techniques that were introduced at this time were big game hunting, which big game hunting was essentially uh, taking some of that automated activity that might affect just a few machines uh, and go hands on keyboard. So they ransomware actors were using like red teamer and pen testing tools and techniques to kind of act like an APT and move through networks, gain enough access to really cause damage. And so at this point, ransomware, you know, really took a, a change in course that has, it's going to impact your, your career. You're going to have to deal with this. It's a, it's big business, essentially the next technique is data extortion. And so the uh, ransomware threat actors realized at some point that, you know, just an availability outage wasn't really enough to get companies to pay, but stealing the data that their clients entrust them with, stealing the the data that they need to, to do business and threatening to release it publicly, impacting their brand image, that had a much, much bigger impact. So those, those are some of the key events of this time period.
And some of the key takeaways, you know, ransomware in much the same way that, you know, the APT, you know, dominated Mindshare in the prior five years, ransomware became everything, you know, and that's every attack that comes out. That's uh, every big headline around cyber, you know, the threat groups that are being tracked, the workload of those IR firms, they're helping companies that have been ransomed. Uh, the widespread adoption of EDR really changed how enterprises were defended. So that was a improvement, right? The ability for companies who could afford that technology had a much better capability of not just detecting malware and like early stage intrusion, but also being able to detect post-exploitation activity. And that actually drove change in terms of how attackers had to operate. And then those internet-wide worm compromises like uh, Mirai, which was on IoT side, uh, WannaCry, NotPetya, that all had sort of an indiscriminate targeting. Those felt novel at the time. Things like that had happened in the past, but it really showed the need for some of those fundamentals I talked about in the beginning of the, the presentation. All right, so what did enterprise attack surface look like in 2015 to 2019? Public cloud utilization had a huge uptick across industry verticals. Uh, in some cases, that DMZ architecture I described, where you know essentially you're really trying to isolate yourself from internet exposed hosts, that hasn't always been adapted well to the cloud. Um, you can find articles online uh, with people declaring the DMZ concept dead in a cloud context, which uh, you know is not something I agree with. And the EDR and other endpoint tooling really revolutionized how SOCs operate uh, in a very positive way. Now, in terms of initial attack vectors, still very, very common for malicious emails to lead to endpoint compromise and be the initial uh, attack vector for a, for a large attack or a targeted attack. But in this time, we see an uptick in what I would consider some of that clumsy activity in terms of exploiting cloud misconfigurations, bigger focus on the expanding perimeter attack surface, uh, and exploitation of, of you know various misconfigurations. So I see this as a bit of a transition period. We'll get into the the 2020 plus uh, here shortly. Now post exploitation, this is a place where some of that adapting uh, technology on the enterprise side really changed how attackers have to operate. So in this time period, somewhere in here, PowerShell post exploitation really fell out of style because EDR tools and endpoint detection and response tools were very good and could be right, you know, telemetry to be able to detect those tools. So especially if people were using something like those frameworks I mentioned, like PowerSploit or Nishang, you would just be detected out of the box by content that was made by the vendor, uh, much less, you know, companies that were doing custom detections. And, you know, direct Windows API utilization which is aided by some of the C2 frameworks like Cobalt Strike, you know, that, that became the norm for even low-skilled attackers. So getting around, you know, EDR and getting around some of the, the developing tools, that's always sort of the cat and mouse game in terms of, you know, enterprise gets better, attackers have to get better, uh, and you go back and forth a bit. All right, 2020 to current. So I would call this, you know, a, a game changed ultimately. Right out of the gate in 2020, we started with solar winds. So a supply chain attack ultimately, uh, you know, initiated by a nation state. But this affected all of the com customers of the company to some degree. Not all the customers were targets, but many, many companies that used this monitoring and management uh, solution from solar winds, they at least got the first stage of compromise from this nation state. So the total number of systems is actually astounding in terms of who is impacted. But ultimately, government targets were really the goal of that campaign. Uh, but that supply chain compromise where a threat actor gets into the code repository for a vendor used by tens of thousands of companies and they put malware in it or they use the update functionality to, uh, you know, to compromise specific customers. That's a little bit of a, a a game changed there where you have to worry about that now. You know, this really uh, changed how we think about internal attack surface, uh, the trust we have to put in certain, you know, monitoring and management tools, 
monitoring for malicious traffic or anomalous traffic, even from some of this known trusted infrastructure, which I think a lot of people weren't doing at the time. Next in 2021, uh, Kaseya, which is a managed a provider of remote administration tooling for uh, managed service providers, they had a vulnerability that was exploited by uh, a ransomware crew. And as a result, around a thousand companies were ransomed through their tool. Because that tooling was used for managing client environments or managing, you know, the you know small medium businesses IT environments, and so that really showed the advancement in terms of these ransomware actors and how they were thinking bigger and adapting to make more money. Um, ransomware in this time period becoming a bigger and bigger business. Uh, people were going from, you know, uh, kind of a normal cars, the, you know, uh, to, uh, Lamborghinis and Ferraris and things. And <laughs> in these circles where, where ransomware actors lived, um, but it was a real changing landscape in, in terms of, uh, some of these techniques, 2022, we see kind of the resurgence of lulsec type activity with scattered spider, uh, so scattered spider group of largely kids by all accounts, um, but using some interesting tradecraft. So using a lot of social engineering tactics, using SIM swapping, uh, you know, a lot of these folks grew up with multi-factor authentication as a fact of life. Well, they'll bypass that by calling your help desk and figuring out how they have to, uh, you know, what are the right keywords they need to say to get you to reset and multi-factor auth token. Uh, so that was actually extremely prolific. A lot of companies affected by scattered spider and lapsus. And, you know, something that materially changed how you have to think about, you know, your attack surface, your help desk, your, uh, you know, how you do self-service, those types of things. Uh, ultimately, do you really have MFA if somebody can just ask for it to be reset? So some good questions posed by uh, the enterprising kids of scattered spider don't go that direction by the way not a good career move it's better to to stay on the the right side of it 2023 some of these same ransom ac uh, actors like plop uh used zero days or you know pursued getting zero day exploits in managed file transfer tools so you saw that back in 2019 the ransomware groups figured out hey let's hit enterprise where it really hurts in their data uh, what's a better place to get data than an internet-facing managed file transfer tool that probably is used to interact between companies? You know, company A needs to share files with company B in a fast sort of way. Uh, ultimately, it has to happen over the internet. They use these types of tools. This is a very, very obvious target in retrospect for ransomware operators. So go anywhere, uh, Excelion, uh, Progress, move it. And ultimately, the the Move It event, which affected many, many, many uh, companies, was probably one of the biggest data breaches in history by volume in terms of the stolen data that was eventually uploaded by the threat actor. Also in 2023, an extremely interesting attack, especially with, I mentioned how much public cloud utilization was, was an uptick in large enterprise across industry verticals. This Storm 0558 Azure hack, if you haven't read about it, I recommend taking a look at it. Essentially what happened is a nation state threat actor gained access to like the control plane of Microsoft's services that they apply to everyone. And so they had the ability to sign authentication for any tenant, for any customer. They could basically take over the entirety of Microsoft Cloud services as I read it. That's my understanding, and that's you know the the uh, you know the conversations I've had with some some other folks uh, who who understand this. We're obviously going off of the the public reporting, but given that level of access, that they could take in control of a huge portion at least of Microsoft's cloud services. What did they do? They went after U.S. State Department email boxes. So the lesson from this, A, is that, you know, your public cloud, it's not mystical. It is ultimately just a, another company's computers. Uh, there is a directory. There is sort of a directory of directories. 
you see only a part of that. A lot of it's abstracted from you, but there is a possibility of public cloud, you know, having an internal like control plane compromise that could affect you. So that's lesson A. Lesson B is, you know, it, to, to use an analogy, these attackers basically hacked the matrix and they used it, their access, not to, you know, get weapons or whatever, like Neo, they used it to get email. So what does that tell you about what the target is in terms of targeted attacks today? And it's kind of always been this way. Your email and collaboration tools are absolutely a huge target. And you should be applying a lot of your thought process in terms of, A, like, how do I understand this uh, attack surface? What are all the different ways you can authenticate to this? What are all the permissions? It's a very complex problem, as, as we see. And getting into 2024, that problem was really highlighted quite well in the Midnight Blizzard attack, which was actually on Microsoft. And so this shows that even for the company making the technology, very, very difficult to do permissions management in this collaboration, email, you know, SharePoint, M365 sort of space. And so the attackers were able to gain access to a tenant owned by the company via password spray. So just utilizing, you know, potential passwords for admin accounts, guessing account names, guessing uh, passwords, and they were able to find that that tenant had a uh, enterprise application that had some rights in the main tenant. And so this shows just how difficult it is to get this right 100% of the time, especially as you add more and more accounts, add more and more uh you know, people add more and more uh, infrastructure to your cloud environments, it gets extremely complex. All right, so 2020 to current key takeaways. Ransomware is still a primary threat. I'm not going to say that that's different, but they definitely expanded their scope to include the compromise of perimeter devices, uh, supply chain compromise, and really widening the scope from that endpoint compromise vector going after the data, right? That's the shift. Uh, some of the significant hacks of public cloud infrastructure, like the Storm 0558 Midnight Blizzard, they really revealed that we have to change our focus to the complexities of these cloud environments, the directories, the integrations, the different types of cloud native resources that ultimately make up modern enterprise uh, infrastructure. The compromise of perimeter devices via zero days, explosive growth in terms of that space in a way that I haven't seen uh, so far in my career. So that's something to definitely take away, like enterprise, uh, external attack surface management, a very important uh, concept. And so from a targeted attack standpoint, your email collaboration platforms, that is a huge target. You should be spending a good amount of your resources on defending those platforms if that wasn't already self-evident. All right, so what did attack surface look like in this time period? Uh, public cloud became ubiquitous, right? Even in highly regulated industries, you know, financial all over the place, they have public cloud. So the days of too many companies, you know, opting out of public cloud are more or less over. Um, they, they have some. Collaboration email platforms that are SaaS or cloud-based are ubiquitous. Almost everyone has that. Uh, if a company tells you they're running their own exchange, that might be a problematic uh, situation in and of itself. Uh, enterprise perimeter exposure has expanded greatly with the cloud. You know, I, I heard somebody on a podcast say, you know, there's like a million ways to shoot yourself in the foot in the cloud. It's absolutely true. Um, and it's very easy to make things public facing. So that enterprise perimeter has grown tremendously. In terms of initial attack vectors, that zero day exploitation of of perimeter facing infrastructure, huge uptick. Cloud misconfigurations, secrets leaks, uh, don't embed credentials in your public GitHub as a example of something that has happened so frequently that Microsoft and GitHub have had to come up with multiple product lines and make part of it free to, to deal with that problem. Ultimately, end, endpoint compromise is still common, but it's not the most cost-effective vector anymore, which is I think is a huge... This might be a controversial take, but I don't think it's the most cost-effective uh, way to initiate a compromise anymore. If you've ever done you know, pen testing, red teaming, 
uh, you know, the, the worst thing about laptops is that people close the lid on you when you have a shell, they, you know, they use them for things, they, they take them from one room to another and lose Wi Fi. I mean, it's, it's terrible. So if you can attack servers and attack uh, resources and APIs that are always up, that's just a lot better, uh, even just from a, you know, attacker mental well being standpoint, then on post exploitation, Cloud privilege escalation lateral movement has become more accessible to hackers. There's a lot more training in this area. Uh, there's a much better understanding of how that works. Kubernetes and CICD have become a common pathway, uh, but still some of these old techniques back to including like the PowerShell days lives on in some of the ransomware affiliates toolbox. So it's a real mixed bag, but I think that we've seen some of these advancements in terms of uh you know what what the enterprise attack surface looks like what the initial attack vectors look like and what post exploitation really means uh today so what's the same ultimately throughout my whole career what are some of the things that are the same investments in your knowledge of computer networking are virtually timeless right a lot of this stuff was created in the 1980s uh or by the 1980s you know tcip TCP IP was made in the 70s, DNS in the 80s. You know, all of these technologies are pretty old and it's very hard to backdate the, the internet or, you know, to upgrade the entire internet, right? What you learn about routing and switching and, uh, you know, DNS and all of this has a long, it, it may last you your entire career. So if you don't have a good handle on computer networking, invest in that. It's absolutely table stakes. Um, a lot of the general ideas around offensive security in terms of how to move laterally, how to uh, achieve lateral movement, privilege escalation are kind of a constant. So investments in learning about basic offsec tradecraft will really serve you well in your career, whether you want to be a CISO or whether you want to be a pen tester, in which case it's not even a question. You have to learn this stuff, but that will that is the investments I made in that. Uh, type of training, I really credit with differentiating me in my career and being a something that allowed me to move forward and, uh, you know, sort of stand out in the crowd. Because if you can, you can say, yeah, you need to pass to that vulnerability. That's one thing if you say, hey, here's a proof of concept of how this can be exploited and what it could mean to you. Um, applying that to pretty much any information security job, it's going to make you more effective. Um, always get approval for actually doing uh, pen testing sort of stuff. Uh, you know, ultimately, you know, knowledge of the legacy infrastructure and how an enterprise used to look is still going to be useful because a lot of this stuff builds over time. You know, a lot of times a company's, you know, from a PR perspective will say, we have zero trust network access. But in reality, they're probably still going to have a, you know, an internal network space. They're probably going to have some sort of WAN. They're going to have a VPN for some use cases, out of band connectivity. So they've probably built stuff over time and added to it and probably secured it better too. But all that stuff still exists at most companies, I think. So knowledge of the legacy enterprise infrastructure is still going to serve you well. And then Ultimately, sort of the basic framework hasn't changed. And we'll go through a couple of things that it wouldn't really be a presentation for me if I didn't go through. So defense development cycle. So I, I'm running a little short on time here, but you know, using a model like attack, using some of the various models that are out now to think about what are the gaps in your visibility? What are the gaps in your detection capabilities uh, across all the different platforms that you're, you're managing? Very important uh, component. Actually testing testing your work in terms of making sure that your detections work, uh, what other telemetry is created whenever you actually test an attack technique. So enabling your SOC, enabling your blue team with purple teaming, as it is called in industry typically, I think is an extremely important step and, and something that I've invested in my in my own career. Developing high confidence detections, prototyping new mitigations, and, you know, a lot of times in a big company, you know, deploying some sort of security change is a, you know, it's an act of Congress, right? It doesn't have to be, you know, I think that it's very important to think about what is the, you know, it doesn't have to be a zero sum game. It's not secure or not secure. 
It's what are the little changes that I can actually make that will reduce that attack surface. Thinking about reducing attack surface, uh, this is a concept that I lifted off of a Mandiant consultant in 2011, and I've been using it ever since. So props to him. Uh, I apologize, I don't have, have his name, but uh, essentially the hierarchy of needs, but applied to, to attackers, right? So the attacker hierarchy of needs. When you think about reducing attack surface, you're trying to rob your adversary of one or more of these things. So thinking about like a modern context, you say, uh, my users' cloud sessions are being stolen from their browsers. Cutting the amount of time that those are valid for is robbing the adversary of their most critical element of time. You know, their amount of time that they have to actually take an action. It's also robbing them credentials. So thinking about this in terms of code execution, network access, credentials, time, these are things that in pretty much every attack, they're going to need these things, right? So think about what you're actually doing and what impact you're having on the attacker uh, whenever you are developing new mitigations. Think about developing mitigations. Ultimately, like I said, not a zero-sum game. You're taking your known attack surface, which you need to understand, and you're saying, okay, how big is it? How many different options does the adversary have? And as you start to develop countermeasures, you know, you're going from this huge known attack surface to monitor to implementing countermeasures that reduce your scope of monitoring. You're always going to have the little darker gray section of unknown attack techniques. You can't really get around that. You know, there's going to be things that uh, come out that are novel. But with what you do know and what you can reasonably know, I believe in this cycle where you ultimately have less to monitor if you have network segmentation, if you have, you know, uh, attack surface reduction on your endpoints, if you are, you know, doing a lot of uh, clever things in terms of securing your cloud accounts, uh, et cetera. So what's different? Defensive tooling. I think one thing that's that's different as future defenders, you're going to get need to get used to a lot of these cloud related acronyms. So CSPM, Cloud Security Posture Management. Uh, you know, cloud entitlements management, cloud workload protection. These, in some cases, are kind of like your EDR of cloud native. And so understanding how you actually monitor for uh, cloud native serverless type infrastructure, what logs you need, uh, what types of tooling you can actually use to expedite and make this easier, that's going to be absolutely critical in your career. Um, so making the, the most of those tools and integrating them into your work is going to be really critical. Attack path management in the cloud, the directories, ACLs, OAuth permissions, apps, service accounts, it's all complex. Uh, you know, it's a complex enough sentence that I just read it directly off my own slide. But this is something that uh, there are a lot of tools to, to help with. So as an example, you know, even the community version of Bloodhound, if you've used that in any of your studies, has an Azure Hound uh, component for pulling this information. External attack surface, more important than ever, cloud adoption has really increased uh, external attack surface, even for very mature organizations. Containerization, you know, obviously has been around for a long time now, but at this point, you know, enterprise applications pretty unlikely to be developed to be deployed on, you know, IaaS or virtual machines more likely that they're going to be deployed via you know, Kubernetes uh, in one way or another, whether that's hosted Kubernetes in, uh, in AWS or Azure or GCP, but that's something you're going to have to deal with. And a lot of times the level of visibility that you can get out of that sort of environment isn't what you're used to in EDR if you've been working in a SOC, uh, primarily defending like Windows and Mac endpoints. And then finally, the collaboration and email you know, software as a service challenge. If this is the biggest target in enterprise, need to spend a lot of time, effort, and training on it. You should be able to manage it. You should understand the different security controls that are available from the vendor and outside. All right, training. Final final slide before we get to, to questions, if we have a little bit of time for that. In the first 10 years of my career, I'd say that there was really sort of a a barrier to entry for some of the good training you know the best training i feel you know offensive security 
sans like i was very very fortunate to get the benefit of some of that expensive training um and you know i think that you should if you can get your companies to to fund some of this uh, more expensive training which is still quite good uh, but there was a much bigger barrier to entry in uh, you know the security specific training really in a lot of ways felt adequate after you had sort of it foundations too like we weren't it didn't feel as necessary for people to be trained on, you know, C sharp or .NET framework or whatever, you know, that the developers and application folks were doing. Fast forward to today, and I feel things have really flipped because there's so many offerings for really low budget uh, training. You know, there's a lot of examples from, uh, you know, Pentester Academy or Try Hack Me or Hack the Box EU. There's a million of them. Um, and these are really inexpensive, but they're hands-on lab-based training. And you can do it starting right after this call if you haven't been utilizing these services. They're really inexpensive. They give you very relevant uh, hands-on knowledge. And typically, you know, you're accessing that just directly from a browser. So you don't even have to set up a virtual machine or a VPN. You know, you, you can just get started immediately. The other component around training is that I think that now directly utilizing the training for you know cloud engineering for containers and kubernetes devops ci cd pipelines this is really becoming uh, table stakes for effective information security folks and this training is actually even more inexpensive in some cases i mean it's it's pretty wild how good some of the training offerings are not an endorsement in any way but i've been going through some uh code cloud with a k training on Kubernetes, and it's been absolutely tremendous. So there's a lot of other options in that space as well. All right. With that, good hunting. I wish you all uh, the best of luck in your careers. And I, I know that uh, there'll be many of you hopefully delivering a similar talk 15 years into your career with all the, the insights and lessons learned you've had. Uh, I know that was a lot of information. Uh, does anyone have any questions for me? Does anyone have questions in the room? There's one in chat. One second, pulling up the chat. Uh, what do you mean by mitigations? Also, when you talk about applying threat intelligence, where does that threat intel come from? Really good questions. So in terms of uh, what do I mean by mitigations, I mean, really any change that you're making, which could be instrumentation and a security tool, it could be a change that you push down to Windows endpoints via GPO, it could be a change in your firewall or some other you know, in intrusion prevention system in the cloud, whatever it is, but a change that you're making specifically to stem some sort of attack technique. So that's kind of a loose definition of how I would define mitigations. And I and typically, you know, mitigation in my mind isn't going to be, you know, a huge change that, you know, is going to take, you know, 10 years, but thinking about like bite-sized changes to improve your security posture. So that's first part of the question. Then applying threat intelligence, I think that, you know, for right out of the gate, you know, some of the best threat intel you get is what you're hearing about in, uh, you know, just information security news. Like, I would really encourage college students to pick up a habit of every day listening to, you know, SANS Internet Storm Center or weekly listening to some of the good podcasts like Risky Business or, uh, you know, just getting some of that news, setting up a, you know, a Feedly or other RSS provider to consume some of this information. Because even if you're not getting everything uh, every day in terms of what's happening, you really pick up on the themes in terms of what's happening in industry. It takes time. It's not trivial to you know keep up a disciplined habit of doing that, but it's something that I think is uh, uh, you know absolutely important for you to to stay relevant. As important as some of the technical training, honestly. Um, other sources of threat intelligence. I mean, you can obviously get. Uh, you know, feeds of, of various capacities. I think that on the free side, you know, even something like uh, any.run or any of the 
the malware uh, you know, engines, search engines that are online. You can get a lot of interesting threat intel through those sources. CISA is a great source of, of threat intelligence. The CISA KEV or known exploited vulnerabilities has really changed how vulnerability management is done globally uh, because now we have this US government organization that's doing a good job of figuring out like what vulnerabilities are most actionable. So that's that's a practical application of of you know freely available uh, threat intel. Hope I answered the question. Happy to to expand on anything if if there's anything more. All right. Any other questions? And if there are uh, further questions for Andrew, uh, you can join our Discord, and then we can uh, relay them to him there. Cool. I'll I'll join the Discord. If you uh, send me a a join link, I'll uh, I'll jump in that Jessica. But in any case, I know we're we're right at time. Don't want to delay things any further. I really appreciate the opportunity to come speak with you. Like I said, best of luck in your career. You're in a great industry. Like like your keynote said, don't uh, don't rest on your laurels. I think is how she put it. Uh, stay stay active in that first job you get. You know, raise your hand to everything. Do lots of training. It won't always be that heavy in terms of the the training you do. Uh, outside of work, but you need to do it in in those early years. Really important. Uh, but take care of yourself. You know this this is a relatively stressful industry. You know it feels you know sometimes a little bit more uh, you know fatalistic than it ultimately is. One of my first bosses, Ben, who is a delightful uh, Englishman, told me, "You know, Andrew, there's no lives at stake here." And I actually needed that at the time because you know we're in the midst of of some uh, fire drill. In any case, take care of yourselves. Uh, gr great uh, luck and great fortunes in your careers and uh, take care of yourselves. Thanks. Thank you so much, Andrew. There's a lot of applause in the room. I'm not sure if you can hear it, but thank you so much. We really appreciate your time.